I want to welcome you to our mothers. I want to say uh, we are very, very thankful. I'm also thankful today for those uh, men, mostly men, who came into the, the church early this morning and put on a wonderful breakfast for our mothers. I think we had about 60 folks that came. We seem to have had a little left over, but I know also that we prepared uh, a little bit more than that. So I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart as your pastor. I'm very, very proud to, to know that I can count on you to lead us in such a wonderful thing. And, and mothers, I pray that you had a wonderful breakfast. Maybe you got a little time, a little bit extra time today. We also have no services tonight so that you can go home. And when I talk to most of the mothers here, the thing they're looking forward to most is a nice long nap today and, <laughs> and their family being around. So I pray that you get just what you desire on that and uh, just encourage them to our families in the church that carry your mamas today. I've got a couple other things, so I hope that all, if I can have all of our mothers, would you just stand up now? Would our mothers just stand up and be recognized? Can we not get more? Yeah. Now, did everybody get one of those uh, little gifts the church was giving you today? If you did not get one of those, come see me afterwards and we'll make sure we give out those. But I've got a couple other gifts that I want to give out. And so, uh, Mark, can I ask you to come up and you're going to help me? Now, what I'd like to do is I want to, we want to recognize uh, the mother in our church. Now, we're going to ask that you're present for these. I know that maybe somewhere we might have a mother representative of, of winning these uh, little extra gifts. But if you're present, that the mother has to be present in our service today. Um, but I want to recognize the mother with the youngest child, our newest mother, if you will. And so I'm going to ask, if you are a mother who has a child that is two years, 24 months old or younger, please stand up. Okay. All right. Let's see. If I go, what if I go 18 months or younger? 18 months or younger? Okay. Well, I think that's it. I think there's only one left. Mark, so let's give her one of these. Now, I need to ask Jennifer, what is this type of plant again? It's a lily. Okay, we're going to give you a lily, if you'll take that to her, Mark, and we'll just send it off to the side, off her feet there. You want to come and get it later? Okay, you can, we'll, we'll just be up here in the front, and you can come be later. We're not done. <laughs> I had you up here to be like my man or wife, Mark. <laughs> can you at least point at him for me? Thank you. <laughs> Now, I want to also recognize the mother in our church with the most children. Now, those children do not have to be present here today. But the mother who has the most children in our sanctuary. So let's start off and let's say, if you have two children, stand up. If there's a mother here with two children, please stand up. Okay, we're good there. All right, if you have three, uh, stay standing. If you have three, stay standing. If you have four children, remain standing. Okay, five children, remain standing. <laughs> Some have played this game before because they don't even get up until like five. They're like, I ain't getting up. I, you don't know how many I got, but I'm not getting up too early. No, no, none of that. Uh, six children, stay standing. Woo! Seven. Seven children? Oh, Ann. You have hit a home run. You deserve one of these. Uh, after the service. Uh, have one of your uh, children take this for you to the car. You deserve at least that. Okay. Now I want to recognize uh, one of our mothers who might be a little more seasoned. We want to recognize the grandmother with the most grandkids. With the most grandchildren. The one with the most grandchildren. So let's start with saying, uh, if you're a mother in here with three grandchildren, I want you to stand up. Three grandchildren. <coughs> Ahmed? 
Daryl, our children's workers, are you guys taking note of the names here? That we're building follow-up contacts right now. Uh, take notes, okay? Uh, four grandchildren remain standing. Five grandchildren remain standing. Six grandchildren remain standing. Seven. Eight. Nine. Uh, okay, how long is this going to take? Ten. <laughs> Ten. Eleven grandchildren. Oh my, we've got a new one. Eleven, gra Eleven grandchildren. Both of you, twelve grandchildren. Twelve here. Oh, twelve, I think, totally, yes. I think we should. Twelve years as well? Thirteen. Thirteen. Twelve's enough, twelve's enough. <laughs> okay, we thirteen wins it. Thirteen wins it. We're definitely counting all right. They would grab one of these on the way. I'll make sure Aaron carries it for you. Well, praise God for all of you. I, I know that my mother is going to be watching the sermon as quickly as we're able to put it online today. Uh, and I want to just give her a special thanks for uh, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, mother she was. And I know that I, I share the sentiment of all the people in here. Day. So what I'd like us to do now, if you will, in your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 31, chapter, or Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. But while we're doing that, I've got a couple things I want to do for you. I want to tell you how Mother's Day began. Many of you have probably heard this illustration before, but if you have not, I want to share it with you. Anna Jarvis, who lived from 1864 to 1948, first suggested the national observance of an annual day honoring all mothers because she had loved her own mother so dearly. At a memorial <coughs> service for her mother on May 10, 1908, Miss Jarvis gave a carnation, her mother's favorite flower, to each person who attended. Within the next few years, the idea of a day to honor mothers gained popularity and Mother's Day was observed in a number of large cities in the U.S. on May 9, 1914 by an act of Congress. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. He established the day as a time for public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. By then it had become customary to wear white carnations to honor departed mothers and red to honor the living, a custom uh, that continues today in some places. We do not hear, but in some places in America that custom still continues. But I had never heard that before, how it began. So I was very interested to read that, uh, simply starting from a, a single person who wanted to honor their mother in a special way. I pray today is not the only day that we honor our mother, but it is a day we set aside to recognize that we honor every day our mothers. I want to show you a video that helps to maybe further illustrate or give you a picture what it is to honor our mother. So let's see that video. Okay. Thank you. 
starting in verse 10. It reads from Proverbs chapter 31. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. And from her earnings she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and she senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Heavenly Father, God has directed us, Lord, today to recognize first and foremost, Lord, that You are our God. It is because of You working and active in the lives of our mothers that, that many of us even are here today. We give You praise, Lord, for Your choosing of our, our mothers. We give You praise, Lord, for Your guiding of their spirit. We give You praise for Your strengthening of their hand and their resolve. We give You praise for those times when they knew more than we knew. We give You praise, Lord, for those things that they did not let us have, which helped mold the person that we are today. Lord, mostly we just praise You for our mothers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm not real familiar with the name Irma Bombeck. I know that she was a, a writer. But she tells a, an interesting story, if I can read it to you, about uh, God's act of creation of the mothers. Now, you've probably heard the simple act of creation that God created, you know, man. He created man and then he worked out all the bugs and then he created women. Now, had you heard that one? That he perfected women after he worked out the bugs. There's also the one that says, you know, that God created Adam and gave him providence to, to name all of the other creation. And, and then God created a woman and Adam turned around and he said, whoa, man. That, that's another theory. But I believe that this one is yet another theory that I want to share with you. Irma Bombeck tells of God in an act of creating mothers. She says that on the day God created mothers, he had already worked long over time. An angel said to him, Lord, you sure are spending a lot of time on this one. The Lord turned and said, have you read the specs on this model? She's supposed to be completely washable, but plastic. She is to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a, a lap that will disappear whenever she stands. She is to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And she is supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, said the angel. Well, that's impossible. It's not the six pairs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It's the three pair of eyes. She's supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there? She already knows what they're doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head to see all the things they're not supposed to see but must see. And then she has one pair right in front that can look at a child that just goofed and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one model. Why don't you rest a while and resume creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm, I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she's sick, who can feed a family of six with a pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely, and he said, she's too soft. Oh, but she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think, asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak, he said. 
I told you you couldn't put that much in one mile. That's not a leap, said the Lord. That's a tear. What's a tear for, asked the angel? Well, it's for joy, for sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment, and for pride. And the angel said to the Lord, you are a genius. Now we know that conversation probably didn't happen. But who also doesn't know that every single thing that was said in there a mother is required to do. It is a special calling to be a mother. This passage is not one that's normally preached. God, God speaks to me differently sometimes. I thought, I'm just, you know, my first Mother's Day, I'm going to pick a very simple one. Mary would be a good one because there's a lot about Mary. But this is a mother that we're speaking of in this passage. Two points, two verses in 15, again in 21, I believe, where it speaks of the whole household. We know that we're not just speaking of a wife. We're speaking of someone who does for their whole household. But there's just a few points I want to share today that I see in this proverb of the most excellent that I want to share with you. Just a few things. We can quickly see examples of godly mothers in Scripture. I mentioned Mary. There's also the wife of Zebedee, right? The sons of James and John. She went to the Lord and she said, Who, which of my sons is going to be on, on this side of you and on that side? Which one is going to have priority in the kingdom? We know from the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 20 that she is a prayer warrior over her sons. She's not the only. We know of Sarah. How about Hannah Samuel's mother? Amazing mom. I could go on and on. But one thing I can tell you about all the mothers in Scripture, all the examples, you know none of them were perfect. We can all agree here today that there's no perfect one. But they all had one thing in common that led them to the perfect. And that was a fear and a trust in God. You see the mother who is held uh, lofted up and, and held to a high reverie or uh, high esteem. That mother is the one who trusts in the Lord. And I believe that's what Scripture said. <clears throat> Look at 2 Timothy. You don't have to do it now. Write it down. Though. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 in verse 5 says, uh, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. <coughs> is there not a, a wonderful example for us to know there that a godly mother is one who's going to train those around her up in the Lord? Well, the first thing I see, if you can uh, jump back to the beginning, verse 10 and, and so forth, God remembers your efforts, mothers. God remembers your efforts. Look at verse 11 again. We see that God reminds us that our mothers are beyond worth. Or in verse 10, it says, An excellent wife, who can find for her? Worth is far above jewels. Now, it did not describe the jewels that it was far above, so we're, we're left to know that the worth of a mother is above anything that had value. The highest level of value of the time that this was written was the jewels and their, their, their way of bartering, their cost, their ownership. And what the psalmist is writing here, or the proper author here is writing, is that the worth of the mother is beyond anything that they had a dollar sign for, a value sign for. There was nothing that was more of worth than the mother. What a wonderful uh, promise. What a wonderful reminder of God loving you. Reminding you of your worth. Again, I see God reminds us that our mothers are trustworthy. Look at verse 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And he will have no lack of gain. You know, growing up in my home, rather it be in elementary school and middle school, I could not type. Teenagers, we grew up in a time, you won't remember, where typewriters were what was used. 
And if you made an error and your teacher had said you could have no errors, you had to start all over again. Anyone remember those times? Thank you, teachers, for that, by the way. But my mother could type. And so I remember that she would do that. If you'll write your story, son, I'll help you type it. But you'll help me in return. So she would type and I would vacuum. Or she would type and I might have to, when I was younger, rub a foot. Or, there was a lot of different things that we did. But I'll tell you this. She never let me down. She would not let me fail. She was one who I could trust. When everything else was against me, when, when I had a bad day, I knew if I just got home, Mother would be there make it all go away. She was trustworthy. Scripture says that one who is trustworthy, who, whose wife is trustworthy, whose mother is trustworthy, will have no lack of gain. Look at the next verse. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. I can truly share with you today that a good mother will enhance your life. I've joked about this, but know it's true also, that when you, the church, hired me to be your pastor, it was my wife who you took into consideration in the hiring process as well. You hired her, and I came along to get with her. I'm thankful for her. In all honesty, she is an asset in ministry and my very best. I have no lack of gain. Verse 13 says, She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. God provides mothers with the heart of an, uh, I'm sorry. God reminds us that our mothers enhance our lives. Our mothers enhance our lives. And God reminds us also that our mothers are there to provide for our needs. What a wonderful way of God not forgetting about you mothers that, that He points these things out in Scripture for them to ever be in His Word. His recollection and His consideration of what you do so vast. Enhancing lives and providing for needs and encouraging and, and doing all these things. Well, look again if we can to verse uh, 15 and 16. In verse 15 it says, She rises also while it is still night and gives food for her household and portions to her maids. Again, you see that provision. And then in 16 we transition and says, She considers a field and buys it from her earnings and she plants a vineyard. I wrote this uh, small illustration. I didn't write it. I found it online. It's a, off of a, an old cartoon, if you will. No one deserves a special day all to herself more than today's mothers. A cartoon showed a psychologist talking to his patient, which happened to be a mother. And the caption read, Let's see, he said, you spend 50% of your energy in your job? And she said, yes. And he says, now if I understand, you also spend 50% of your energy on your husband? To which she said, yes. And 50% on your children? And she said, yes. And he said, I think we see the problem here. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that true? That, that a woman is asked to do all these things. A mother is asked to do all these things. 50% for work. 50% for the husband. 50% for the home. And yet, we can only give 100%. Look at verse 16 and 17 again. She considers a field and buys it from her earnings and she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. I see in these two verses that God provides mothers with the ability to do for the family. Again, more than just the provision of the food, but the ability to do. I used to say my mom could take two pennies and make a quarter. She could stretch the dollar that far. I remember growing up, we didn't have much when I was a young kid. My father worked very hard and, and he worked himself into a very good job. 
But when we were young, we were just starting. <clears throat> and we would have a dollar or a dollar fifty left at the middle of the week to finish the week out. And we'd get to Friday and we'd, as a family, my mom and dad would want to do something special. And they would say, well, we could put, <laughs> this ain't going to make sense either anymore. We could put a dollar in the gas tank and we could get a couple of things, uh, you know, meals together and out of the cupboard and stuff. And we could go camp all weekend. And we would do that. And you know, it was some of the finest times of my life. Didn't cost a dime. Just mom and dad, and me, and my brother, and that old trusted dog. Up in the mountains, or where, just being together. But she always was able to make it work. She provided for the family's needs. Look at verse 18 and 19. She senses that her gain is good, and her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. You see, God's provide mothers with an incredible work ethic. We'll go off to work in the morning. What's that teenager says, I earn my, my living. I work for a living. So that husband might say, I work for a living. To them I ask, what do you do when you first get up? Well, I get up and I have breakfast. Who prepares it? The mom, the wife. And then off to work we go. And we come home and what's the first thing we expect when we walk through the door? Dinner. Who's prepared it? Now you know she didn't sleep all day. She didn't sleep all day. She grocery shops, she vacuumed, blah, 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 blah. All the different things that go on. Probably fixing a fan in the room or uh, taking care of the, the, the cable company because they always mess up. Whatever the case, she's doing all those things for us. And then at the end of the night, we sit down to watch a show. Just one before bed. But she's nowhere to be found because she's still holding laundry. An incredible work. To which someone might say, well, what does your mom do? Do? She don't do nothing. She doesn't have a job. Isn't that what the world says? But I tell you, what a job. What a job. An incredible work ethic. Well, look, look again at verse 20. It says, she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. You know that God gives mothers the heart of a nurturer. It is not natural to the level with which they go to nurture, to meet the needs of their loved ones. Wiping, a, scraping a boo-boo, cleaning it off, loving and picking you up, a broken relationship, you come home crying, right there to tell you it's going to be fine. All those things, an incredible nurture, you ever seen a baby cry, passed around from person to person, and then you put that baby in the arms of the mother, and what happens? Most of the time, peace, instant comfort, instant comfort. Look at verses 21 and 22. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. God provides mothers with a heart for the home. It's a thankless job at times. One that is just overlooked. Even our current government says it would be better for you mothers to work. But if you do not have the initiative or the go attitude or the intelligence to work, then I guess being a stay-at-home mom is okay. That's our current administration. And let me tell you something. To stay at home and make that house work, you have to be highly intelligent. You have to be highly motivated. It is the hardest job. It is not the easiest job. Work if you must. But oh, God, it has a beautiful, beautiful plan when you build them up. Especially those who can do both and all. God provides mothers with a heart for the home. Well, my third point and the last point of this passage is God shares mothers. God shares your burdens. You're not alone in this. 
If I could just take you to verse 30 and point out the, the central theme of this passage is that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Remember, at the heart of every home has to be a parent pointing to Christ. Preferably both parents pointing to Christ. But even in Timothy's life, what transformed him, what put him on the mission field, what set him apart from his peers of the time was not his good ability to communicate. It was not his, his great oratory skills. It was not his good work ethic. It was not his uh, hand to the, the, the plow mentality. It wasn't any of that. Paul said about him, it was his grandmother, Lois, and his mother who poured into him Christ. And because of that, he was who he was. God shares your burdens, mothers. Look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when, the, when he sits among the elders of the land. We've heard the saying, behind every good man is a great woman. The Bible just says it better. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. God blesses mothers with a vision for the future. When He shares your burdens, He gives you a vision for what's to come. When you're having a problem with that 12-year-old who's not quite listening the way you intended them to listen, He gives you a vision for the future. When you're struggling with the <clears throat> adolescent years, He gives you a vision for the future. I've shared with you this on numerous occasions. But I can remember vividly seeing my mom knelt at the side of my bed praying over me in my most troubled times. I can remember all the phone calls when everyone else had said, you know, Kurt, maybe you're just not destined to be anything at all. And my mom always saying, son, God has given you so much potential. I look forward to the day when he uses it. I remember those days vividly. Because even if they didn't register here, they most certainly registered here. And God transformed me. And I believe that those prayers were a large part of it. Verse 26. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. <coughs> Do you notice the progression that God <coughs> Blesses the mother with wisdom. She opens her mouth. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. The love. The words. The kindness. Verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household. Again pointing out this mother. This wife. This person who takes care of the whole house. And does not eat the bread of idleness. There is no time. Well, I'll tell you, that's a message today for the church too. It's not just for the mothers. That's a message for the church. That we should not be idle. We should not be sitting by watching as things happen. We should not be watching our homes go. We should not be soliciting the electric babysitter to raise our kids. That we should be not an idle home. What an encouragement. <clears throat> Verse 28, her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. You're the best. And you know, as much as I love my mother, I know that I have married someone just as good, who excels all the rest. Men, children, Brothers and sisters, let's not forget today to thank those mothers in our life who have done so much. You know, this isn't just a story for mothers, though. Because my mom lives way out in California. God has always provided for me. 
Someone to step in that gap. Sometimes my mothers pick them out for me. I'm going to let them be your mother while I'm away. God has always provided someone or some ones who have loved and filled that role. And this is their day too. A day in which we can celebrate them. It's not the biology that makes the mother. I believe more so it's the theology. But either way, it's about the love that pours out of them. Church, let me tell you something today. We can learn a lot from our moms. But the one thing I think we can learn the most is that we had better be nurturing to this community. We had better be not idle in our efforts. We had better be focused on raising them up. We better be aware of clothing them. That's why I'm so excited about what the students did this weekend. One, they learned a little bit about themselves. <clears throat> Maybe at first they start off a little bit too focused on how hungry they were, when really that was never the issue. But somewhere along the way, some of them at least learned how much it must be like, how much it must hurt to be like that out there alone. Remember the church has been called to take these characteristics of the mother here in our home and to demonstrate them out there seeking to grow this family. Just maybe we should learn something from our mothers. And it starts at verse 30. It should be the beginning of this chapter. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. It's not going to be how you act. It's not going to be how you look. It's going to be about who you serve. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. <clears throat> I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who was born of the promise to a virgin named Mary. I believe in the love Mary gave her son <clears throat> that caused her to follow Him in His ministry and to stand by His cross as He died. I believe in the love of all mothers and its importance in the lives of the children they bear. It is stronger than steel, softer than down, and more resilient than a green sapling on the hillside. It closes wounds, melts disappointments, enables the weakest child to stand tall and straight in the fields of adversity. I believe that this love even at its best, is only a shadow of the love of God. A dark reflection of all that we can expect of Him, both in this life and the next. And I believe that one of the most beautiful sights in the world is a mother who lets the greater love flow through her to her children, blessing the world with tenderness of her touch and the tears of her joy. A pastor named John Kirkendall wrote that. But I can tell you this today. We should be thankful for our mothers. We should give praise to God today for what they have done in our lives. And I am joyful to be able to share with you this passage of Scripture that highlights what many of them look like. But can I just say this in closing? Maybe today you've come here a mother or soon-to-be mother or just became mother, been a mother for a long time, and and you recognize maybe that, that it hasn't always been good, your efforts towards the Lord. Maybe it's not always been good, the results. Maybe you're bound up today feeling as if you failed. I just want to challenge you with this. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Whatever condition you came here today, mothers, whatever condition you came here today, you can leave different. You can leave with a great fear of the Lord, a great love for the Lord, and a great understanding from the Lord. It is not the easy work, it's the hardest. But you can know today whom you serve. And it will transform your life. So maybe you've come here today and 
you haven't even really given Jesus consideration. Maybe somebody just asked you to come because, well, that's what we do on Mother's Day. Maybe you've been understanding for a long time but never made that commitment. Maybe you're just broken because it's not working out the way you had thought. Maybe it doesn't look like the fairy tale you'd hoped it was. Whatever the case, I want you to know that your God loves you. My God loves you. He wants for you to have this life. He did not put it in here as a discouragement. It's written out in Scripture as an encouragement to you mothers and to us church. It is the goal with which we should be challenged to achieve, apprehend, and chase after all the days of our life. It begins with fearing the Lord. So maybe there's a break in your fearing of the Lord today. I'm going to ask Garvin, Ken, and Pat if you'll come and lead us in a time of worship. I'm going to ask you, church, stand with me.